Okay, so how do you do this? Here we're going to use a, a kind of a, a core, so-called core area formula. Try to generate a generic uh, boundary uh, boundary uh, condition here. So first of all, you you have a cartopoly, so that uh, the 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 integral of the gradient L uh, squared on B three half is bounded by the integral. Uh, of, of the solution L2 norm on B2, that's just cartopoly. Okay, and next, and I claim that uh, there is always a T between one and three halves, so that this uh, surface integral, this is a volume integral in the cartopoly, but now I want to get something on the surface integral. Uh, on the boundary of uh, uh, ball of radius t is controlled by the right hand side, possibly with a different constant. The way to argue is that you do this by contradiction. Suppose no such t exists, and then you simply integrate in t, and by the core area formula, you can arrive at a inequality which is uh, in contradiction with the cartopoly. So such t always exists. Okay, and then we're going to use this uh, generic boundary uh, data to generate the, uh, the approximation function W. So in other words, we're going to solve L0, W equal to zero, L0 is the homogenized operator, with a boundary data U epsilon on the boundary of BT. Okay, so, 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 uh, so in other words, that uh, W actually is, is the homogenized uh, solution uh, for, uh, f for U y, but in the ball of, of BT here. Okay, and then we're gonna apply the convergence rate theorem on the ball of, ra of radius BT, which contain B1, so you can certainly from B one to BT, and the right hand side is I remember you you have H1 norm uh, of the boundary data here. This is this is the H1 norm on a, on a, on the boundary of a BT, and by the choice of T, it's bounded by the L2 norm of B U epsilon on the ball of B2 here. Okay. And so that's, that's one of the reasons that uh, when we're looking for a uh, convergence theorem, we want to have H1 norm on the boundary, uh, but no more, no higher than that. Uh, okay. Any questions about this? So this, this uh, give us the, the proof of this theorem here. All right, so, uh, so yeah, we already did this. Boundary regularity, so how do we, how do we uh, extend this uh, idea to, uh, to prove uh, boundary ellipses for both uh, Dirichlet and Neumann data here? So first of all, let's just uh, localize, uh, localize to the boundary here. You need to be just a little careful because even though our domain is C1 alpha, you do not want to choose the tiny, the tiny the plane as your coordinate plane because that will uh, destroy the periodicity structure, but, but, but of course you can always choose a coordinate so that uh, it, it's c the, the, the boundary can be represented uh, in a graph, okay? I can, I can have a phi of zero equal to zero, but I cannot insist the gradient of zero of psi is also zero, okay? So that's, uh, so, so it's, uh, you, you, you have, so it's, you, boundary data, your fixed boundary here, and you somehow uh, looking at this is your dr, and the boundary, this part will be called delta r. This is the boundary of omega here, okay? 
All right, so let's say we have a local solution near the boundary, uh, right-hand side F in B2, and with boundary data F on delta 2. Delta 2 is part of uh, the boundary of omega here. So uh, for the dd -clap problem, uh, we, so we're gonna, the first term is the same. Instead of ball, you're gonna look at uh, this uh, D, of all, D of T, which roughly is the intersection of a ball with omega. Uh, okay, that's it's, it's the same. You still take the infimium, uh This is also a linear function here. Th there's no character, as, as, as you point out, you see that here. No character involved, just a linear function here. Okay, if you have a right hand side, you, we can, you can put this in here the LP norm, the LP average multiplied by T, that's the right scale. And then you have to p uh, put up. Uh, terms which involve the boundary data. So you want to subtract a uh, linear function uh, from the boundary data, take the tangential derivative and measure this in L infinity norm. And then you also want to uh, measure the C sigma norm of the tangential derivative and um, properly rescaled. So that is the setup, okay? And then we're going to go through the same scheme. And, uh, and then, of course, you have to prove some convergence rates and approximation uh, in this context, which can be done. I just tell you that it's, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think in the next notes, I did this for the Neumann, and you can figure out the, the stuff yourself for the DD clan. All right, so let's go to Neumann. Okay, so for the Neumann problem, you, you uh, again, the setup is the same for the first term, you look at the difference of your solution uh, and the linear function and take the infimium uh, among all linear functions, the L2 average. Second term is the same. The, the last two terms is a little tricky here. So here, G is the Neumann data, the Neumann data of uh, UY. So somehow you will need to subtract the co-normal derivative of the linear function with respect to the homogenized operator. So here is not new epsilon, but new zero. New zero is the co-normal derivative for L zero. So otherwise, it's the, it's the same. You have to write, this is a L infinity norm, and this is a C uh, sigma norm here. That, that is the setup. And in the lecture notes, I have all the, this, I did the details for the Neumann problem, and, 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 uh, and uh, you, you have s uh, all the detail of the proof presented there. Do you have any questions? All right, so uh, I want to mention uh, some uh, other stuff uh, uh, in periodic uh, homogenization. Uh, in the last section, I covered, uh, of the lecture notes, I covered the cosmo sigma uh, theory. In, so in particular, uh, we can prove uh, this theorem here. So you have, so, so this is sometimes called a W1P estimate. So assuming A is elliptic, periodic, uh, here we're going all the scales. We're gonna have to assume some uh, uh, smoothness, but for W1P estimate, uh, the so-called VMO uh, is enough. The closure of a continuous function in the class of BMO, okay? And the domain C1 will be, f will be, will be suffice. Uh, and you solve this uh, uh, boundary value problem you can, uh, with boundary value zero. You can also put a boundary data G here in some best of space. And then uh, you have this estimate. This is called a W1P estimate, but it's the same thing as you see for Carlos Zygmunt estimate for Laplace. This is also the cardinal sigma estimate for the operator L epsilon. The, the, the key is that this constant C is independent of epsilon. It depends on the parameter, it depends on exponent P 
on omega, on electricity, and on BMO norm of the coefficient. Okay. So this, uh, there's a kind of a revised a real variable argument, uh, kind of improved version of the classical theory presented in section five of the lecture notes. Yeah. Okay, the other thing I want to mention is that a lot of this has been extended to the almost periodic setting. I'll just we spend the last uh, 10 minutes, if I have. Uh, uh, this, tell, tell you a little bit about almost, what is almost periodic homogenization here. So up to now, the assumptions we have on the coefficient is that uh, the coefficient is elliptic and periodic. Okay, so can we go beyond that? Of course, uh, uh, of course you can. And so here is a case, almost periodic case. So first, let's just uh, define what, what's an almost periodic function. There are different classes of almost periodic functions. Uh, they all are coming from by taking the closure of the class of trigonometric polynomials uh, with respect to certain norm or semi norm. Okay? This, uh, so here you start with a trigonometric, trigonometric polynomials. What's a trigonometric polynomials? It's just a finite sum of uh, exponential functions. Okay? So the coefficient AL can be complex, but the exponents here, lambda L, needs to be in the Euclidean space RD. Okay? So here I give you a function which is uh, almost periodic but not periodic. So you have a function sine two pi x. That's a function. That's a periodic function per period one, and this is uh, a function with period of a square root of two. And because square root of two is irrational, uh, the sum of these two periodic functions is not a periodic function. There's no common period. But it is a trigono trigonometric polynomial, so in particular, it's a, a almost periodic function. Okay, so the smallest class is called the uniform, uniformly almost periodic. Uh, it's also called almost periodic in the sense of a ball. Okay, and uh, this are the class of functions are obtained by taking the closure of this uh, class of trig polynomials with respect to the L infinity norm, the uniform norm. Uh, so in other words, we say a function is uniformly almost periodic if it is the uniform limit of a sequence of uh, trigonometric polynomials. Okay, that's the definition here. Uh, there, there are larger classes uh, of almost periodic functions. All right, so here I show you the graph of uh, this uh, almost periodic function. So it's, it's oscillating, just like a periodic function, but the graph never repeat itself. Okay, so it's, there's something, the word almost periodic is that somehow that you can actually match two graphs to arbitrarily small. Uh, okay, so uh, the, the qualitative uh, theory for almost periodic homogenization was, was done a long time ago. It's uh, late 70s and early 80s. Uh, so you, you still have uh, uh, the convergence of uh, a boundary value problem, okay? So A is elliptic and almost periodic. Uh, omega is a Lipschitz domain, you, know, you solve a Dirichlet problem, and you let y goes to zero, then the solution will goes to, uh, will have a limit weakly in H1, and moreover, the limit is a solution of a boundary value problem uh, uh, for an operator with constant coefficients. Okay, so the proof uh, uh, they can be done using a DV curl lemma, 
but it requires a different approach as we, uh, from a periodic case. In the periodic case, the, one of the bigger, biggest problem goes beyond, when you go beyond periodic, is that you do not have a corrector. Remember, the corrector in a periodic setting was obtained by solving a periodic boundary value problem on a periodic cell uh, using lax milligram. And now you do not have a periodic cell to work with if your function, if your coefficient is not periodic. And so all, for almost periodic function, you, there's no periodic cell. How do, you, how, do you, how do you find the corrector? Actually, the corrector may not even exist in this almost periodic setting. Okay, so nevertheless, the uh, qualitative theory can be done uh, using some uh, abstract uh, setting involve a Wiles uh, decomposition. Yeah. All right, but to do the quantitative theory, uh, people introduce something called a proximate corrector. So the proximate corrector uh, def define you, s you look at this this uh, this the equation here, okay? It's the same equation for the corrector equation. However, with an actual uh, uh, zero order term, uh, t here is positive, large, okay? So the idea is that without this term, you were not able to solve this equation. Uh, certainly not with uh, a lax milligram because, because the bilinear form is not going to be coercive in H1 in the whole space. Okay, so the idea is to re regularize the equation. Uh, in this case, it's that uh, you actually add a zero order term to force the coercivity. And then you can generate a solution. Actually, you can generate a solution which is uniformly locally uh, in H, H1, so satisfy these conditions. And then the idea is, uh, the, in the almost periodic setting, also in the uh, random case, is to study the behavior of this proximate corrector as t goes to infinity. Okay? So, and that's, uh, Okay, so uh, there, th and furthermore, in, in almost periodic setting, there's uh, some important quantity uh, I want to just mention here, is that how do you quantify the almost per periodicity of a function here? So one way uh, you can do that is, is to look at the translation of your function. So, so if you have a periodic, periodic function, you translate by a period, the graphs matches perfectly, okay? Here, what you do is that you, look, you take a translation in Y, and you want, to tra you want to match that with a translation in Z, but Z cannot be too big. And you look at uh, the L infinity norm of the difference. You call this function a uh, row of R, and R is large, okay? So in particular, that if A is periodic, this function will be uh, zero for R greater than a period. Uh, but in general, uh, you can actually prove that if A is uniformly almost periodic, this f if and only if this function goes to zero as R goes to infinity. So we're going to use this function rho of R to quantify uh, how far your almost periodic function is from periodic function uh, in terms of the decay of this. Okay, so this uh, this actually is, this uh, function is used uh, to in a proof in a theorem uh, regarding the Lipschitz estimate uh, in almost periodic setting. So this is a theorem due to Scott Armstrong and myself, and uh, so under the condition that uh, the rule of R decays uh, faster than some negative power of log R. And uh, we have uh, 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 Lipschitz estimate for the Dirichlet problem, and also Lipschitz estimate for Neumann problem, okay? Uh, the condition on A is, is it's not gonna be optimal, but it's an interesting open problem uh, to see if you need 
uh, any condition at all in the almost periodic case. Okay, so I want to mention that uh, the uh, smoothness is not a problem here. You can assume this, your coefficient is C infinity, uh, but uh, uniformly almost periodic uh, and, and uh, elliptic. The question is, do you have interior, even interior uh, Lipschitz estimate? That would be a, a problem to think about. All right, all right, I want to thank you very much for taking this course and good luck.